If you go out in the woods today, you are sure for a big surprise. Now, I'm always one for spending time out in nature and enjoying the wilderness, but you always have to be a little bit careful of where you go and what you get up to. And that's the theme of tonight's fantastic story. Nowhere near as gruesome as the one I told you on Monday, but all good just the same. Now, my dear friends, I think you know what time it is. It's hump day, so please sit back and relax with your favorite drink, because it's time to listen. Down here in the south, riding horses is still a fairly popular hobby amongst many folks. There are many different types of riding, but I've always been keen to trail ride myself. Trail riding is just what it says it is. Riding your horse through trails in the woods, mountains, hills, and hollows. As anyone from round here, Tennessee, would tell you, it gets hotter than the devil's nutsack, especially during the summer months. That is to say, when it's summertime, trail riding takes place at night. Often we wait until early fall to begin riding, because the weather makes it easier. But during the summer, we ride at night. These rides are always a time and a half. It's usually just a small group of us that gets together. We all gather at the edge of the woods, find the trailhead, and from there, we set out together for a long night of trail riding through some of the South's last uncivilized land. This particular story, and ride, took place in early August three years back. My father and I met up with our friends J.R. and H. around 8 p.m. at a place known to the locals as Gilly Hill. It has this name because the trailhead is behind the Gilly Hill Church of Christ and Cemetery. Yeah, I know it sounds bad already. But this has been the only trailhead to this ride for as long as I can remember, and it's never caused any sort of problems. So, like I said, we set off for a long night of horse riding, and for everyone but me, a long night of drinking. Now note, I never drank when we rode, because I wasn't of age, and I was our designated driver. I'm aware this all may sound very dangerous, or even strange, but I assure you it's not, at least not to us. Gilly Hill is full of well-traveled trails during the winter, but during the summer people don't ride as much, and the trails grow up, making it easy to get lost or at least turned around. Horses are smarter than most folk give them credit for, though. They have a tremendous sense of direction, and can see well at night. The only problem with horses being able to see at night is that in order for them to maintain their vision, it needs to remain dark. This leaves you without anything to improve your own vision while you ride a thousand pound animal in the dark through the middle of a wooded nowhere. The only exception to this is one may use a dim light with a red bulb and red lens. For whatever reason, which I'm sure someone here can explain, these lights won't make your horse night blind, as we call it. Aside from that, the only light we have comes from the glow sticks everyone ties to the front and back of their saddles, so we can keep up with each other easily. Anyway, back to that August night. Ours came and went with nothing out of the ordinary happening, as we rode and covered a lot of ground, constantly putting more distance between us and our horse trailers. I guess it was around midnight when I made the comment that I was hungry and had brought food to cook, implying I wanted to stop for more than just a few minutes to build a fire and eat. Unsurprisingly, I was not the only hungry one because we immediately stopped and within a few minutes had a fire roaring and hot dogs roasting. When we would stop for any period of time, we would always tie our horses to trees in a circle and gather in the middle to do our thing. This was done especially at night, for more than one reason. First, because it allowed everyone to relax a little, as we could all keep an eye on the horses together and made sure they didn't run off. This had happened before, and it's nearly impossible to catch a wild horse in the woods at night. The second reason is because horses are very alert animals that have superb hearing. 
by having them form a circle around us. It served as a natural alarm to any unwanted visitors, human or not. After all, we were in the middle of nowhere in the woods at night. The horses formed a circle, and inside the circle we all sat by our fire, eating, drinking, and carrying on. I suddenly had the urge to piss, so I stood up and walked out a few yards to the other side of my horse to go. It was there and then that I noticed a dim light, about fifty or sixty yards away, give or take. This wasn't completely strange, but it triggered my nerves, to say the least. If someone was out here with a flashlight or headlamp, that meant they were on foot. And who would be out this far, this late, walking through the woods? I finished my business and just stood there for a few seconds, staring at the light. I slowly began to realize it was moving towards us a little at a time. Still, something wasn't right about it. The light was just moving closer and closer in a smooth, straight line. If it was a person with a flashlight, the light would be moving and shaking as they were walking through the woods. Brad! A voice hacked through the thick summer air from behind me, and I about jumped out of my boots as I turned around to see my dad walking up beside me. What are you doing? You still pissing? It's been ten minutes. He asked me in a semi-slur through a chuckle. I could tell the peach brandy was doing work on him. No, Dad. Well, I mean, yes, I was finished, but I noticed that light over there. Who the hell you reckon that is out here this late? I replied. He squinted and peered out towards where the light was. He was quiet for a minute before speaking again. Huh. That's weird. Has it moved at all? I explained to him it had moved, but that it didn't seem right. He was just getting closer, but it didn't look like someone walking. He just shrugged it off and suggested we put the fire out and get moving, just in case the light is a landowner that had changed their mind about letting us ride out here. The land was owned by the church, but they sometimes rented it for people to farm a couple of fields that sat on top of the hollers, and these people often weren't fans of horse riders. So, we actively avoided them, which was easy on hundreds of acres. An hour or so later, we decided to stop again for the drinkers to relieve themselves of the beer and liquor they'd been drinking since we began the ride. This time I stayed on my horse, as I didn't need to go, and I didn't want to tie him up just to untie him in a couple of minutes. I was sitting there, taking in the cool breeze that had finally decided to show up, when my horse, Zeb, became agitated. Zeb started breathing heavily and shifting his weight back and forth from side to side, a clear sign he was uneasy about something. I was unsuccessfully attempting to calm him down when out of nowhere my dad's horse bolted. He went from standing still to a wide open run. My dad, who had just finished peeing, was holding onto the reins in one hand and zipping his pants with the other. The sudden jerk had knocked him on his ass. In that split second, I had a choice to make. Let the horse go and face the likelihood we'd not only lost a $3,000 animal, but that being the youngest, I would have to let my dad ride my horse while I walked back beside him. I contemplated momentarily and then made what was, probably, the worst decision of my life. Zeb was moving so fast my eyes were watering. Still, I tried to keep my focus on the glow stick that was swinging back and forth on the back of the saddle as his horse barreled through the woods. It didn't go unnoticed that my dad's horse was running back in the same direction where I'd noticed the light earlier. But I tried to put that thought away, as for the moment I needed to catch him. I should have just let it go and gone back to my dad and our two trail buddies. We could have gone back to the trailer and waited until daylight to look for the horse. But I was young and proud. I could catch it, or so I thought. By now I'd lost track of the distance Zeb and I had put between us and the others. My only focus was that bouncing glow stick. 
I was gaining ground on the wild horse. Just a little closer, and I could get a hold of him and bring him back. And then, the glow stick vanished. I pulled back on the reins and shouted, Whoa! Zeb came to a stop so fast, I thought it was going to fly over his ears. Where had the glow stick gone? If it had fallen off, I would have seen it. Or at least, see it now. I was so close to where it disappeared, from the best I could guess. Yet, nothing. I decided to get off my horse, tie him to a tree, and look for the glow stick on the ground. After a few minutes of kicking leaves around, I couldn't find anything. I walked over to Zeb and pulled my flashlight out and scanned the area around me, accomplishing nothing, except for giving up my position, as I would later discover. The horse had just vanished. How could it? I was standing there rationalizing what had happened, when I noticed the light. It was back and was about 50 yards away. This time it was moving towards me a little quicker than before, but still in the same smooth manner. I was beginning to be afraid now. I went back to my saddlebags, pulled out my camping hatchet, attached it to my belt, and grabbed my cell phone. Nine times out of ten, we have no cell service at all, but it was worth trying. To my surprise, I had one bar. All right, I thought. I'll call my dad and ask him if his horse had shown up, and then tell him to blink his flashlight in my direction so I could find my way back to the group. The phone only rang once when he answered. Hello, Brad? What the hell are you doing? I'm just down the trail some, Dad. I can't find your horse. We'll have to look for him tomorrow, I said. What? He replied and I noticed he sounded confused and unsure what to say. It must be the drinking, I thought. So, I tried to speak slower and clearer this time. I didn't catch your horse, Dad. We will try again tomorrow. Dad didn't respond for a few minutes, before finally saying, Brad, you are worrying me. What are you talking about catching my horse? I'm standing right beside him. Why did you take off like that? Come back now, this isn't funny. Just come back now. Come back now. Come back. Back. Now. My blood ran cold. I just ran off. What was he talking about? I was chasing his horse. Uh, Dad... I was chasing after him. He ran off and I lost his trail. What do you mean you're standing beside him? Did he circle back? I asked hesitantly. My dad was now basically shouting into the phone at me. No, I told you to cut it out. Come back now. Come, on, come back. And with that, my phone beeped. And I looked down at the screen and read. Call dropped. No service. Of course... I was frozen in my tracks. I know I saw his horse run off. I'm not crazy. Hell, I chased it for ten minutes. I took a few minutes to get myself together before getting back on Zeb. I noticed the lights I'd kept seeing hadn't moved any closer. I turned my horse to head back in the direction of my dad when I saw a light come on from where they all must have been waiting. As I started back in that direction, the light ahead of me started blinking. I was finally calming down and feeling relieved when I remembered I never told my dad to flash his light at me on the phone. I stopped Zeb and turned back towards the other light. It was now moving towards me and blinking as well. What in the hell was happening? I was officially terrified. When my phone vibrated, I put it out and looked down at the screen. It was a text from a number I didn't recognize. I opened the text and read, Brad, it's Dad. My phone's in the truck. Horse came back. 
Where are you? Sweat dripped from my forehead, and my hand shook as I read the message again. Brad is dead. My phone's in the truck. Horse came back. Where are you? I felt like an idiot. I knew my father never brought his cell phone when we rode. He always stuck his phone and wallet under the floor mat for safekeeping, as well as to protect them from being lost. So, who had I talked to? The person asked me why I ran off and why I was trying to catch their horse. Clearly they had some idea about what was going on. Hell, maybe they'd been watching us. Whatever the case was, I didn't like it. The land we rode on was owned by the church, I knew that much, but I didn't have a clue about the surrounding property. The Gilly Hill Church of Christ is fairly isolated, so it was safe to assume that the land surrounding it was as well. We're talking about hundreds of acres that are nothing but wooded mountains and hills. It isn't like this was farmland that was being worked and watched on a regular basis. We very rarely encountered any other people. The only issue we ever ran into was disgruntled hunters who were trying to hunt illegally on the church's property. Multiple horses and drunken riders do a pretty good job at scaring off any deer that might be in the area. I did my best to calm myself down a bit. I needed to take care of business and backtrack to where I'd left my dad and the others. It could have been fear or just a little paranoia but I took the glow sticks off my horse and stuck them in my saddle's bags. If someone was following me, I wasn't going to help them. Plus, they were only there for the other riders to be able to see me, and I was alone now. The lights I mentioned seeing earlier were still blinking and coming from both directions, ahead and behind me. I was still fairly sure which one was coming from where I estimated my dad to be, so, that's the one I used as my North Star, so to speak. Sure, it seems easy to know which way I'd come from, but these woods ain't your run-of-the-mill dark. They are so dark you can't see past your horse's ears when you're in the saddle. The only saving grace is the occasional opening in the trees, where the moon can shine through and illuminate the surrounding area. It seemed like Zeb was tiptoeing, as we slowly headed towards the blinking light. Old Zeb was always light-hoofed when he sensed something was off, or at the very least when he could tell I was uneasy. Horses are strange like that, keen to their surroundings, and Zeb was one of the best horses I'd ever owned. He was well-mannered, calm, and when you needed him to hit another gear, boy could he fly. Zem and I had made it a few hundred yards closer to the light, when it simply disappeared. Still hopeful it was my dad, or one of the others holding the flashlight, we kept travelling in that direction. We'd almost made it to the edge of the clearing, where we'd stopped earlier when my dad's horse had taken off. And that's when I started faintly smelling something similar to mothballs. As we got closer to the clearing, the smell got stronger. I pulled the reins back and quietly instructed Zeb to stop with a whoa now. We instantly came to a complete stop. Now, just outside of where the moonlight started at the edge of the opening, I noticed there were two large dark piles of mounds or, or masses of something just on the other side of the clearing, back in the woods a bit, but they were too far out of the light for me to figure out what they were. I sat on the back of my horse in complete silence, trying to make out what I was seeing. I heard a branch from above break, and something made a loud thud on the ground, mere feet in front of us. It stood just in the light from the moon, making it barely visible. It was eye level with me from the back of my horse, and was as lean as a telephone pole. Its large eyes glowed with a solid, soft, white light that flickered as we stood, frozen, gazing upon each other. 
The eyes reminded me of movie projectors, the way they cast dim light out ahead of its body. The creature slowly lifted both of its long arms out to either side, as it stood in front of us, unmoved. It held something round in its right hand, but I couldn't make out what it was. Zeb, following a brief pause, stood straight up on his back legs and threw me off so fast I didn't have time to react. I landed on my back, slamming my head into the ground, and a sharp and a sharp pain shot down my spine. In a panic, I tried to get to my feet, but dizziness took over, throwing me down to my knees. Everything was spinning, including Zeb, who brought his front hooves down as he spun on a dime, and like that, he was gone, with my cell phone, flashlight, and other supplies in his saddlebags. Pure panic and adrenaline filled my body. I was scrambling on my hands and knees, occasionally making it to my feet only to take a few steps and trip or fall down again in pain. I heard a loud thud and Zeb neigh from behind me. I didn't know where I was going, except that it was away from whatever the hell that thing was. I kept putting as much ground as possible between me and the creature as fast as I could. I couldn't turn to look behind me without tripping over something in the dark, but I heard a voice, my father's voice. It was slurred and sounded like he was drowning. It began repeating, Brad, you are worrying me. Catch my horse. Catch my horse. It took nearly all of my strength, but I made it to the other side of the clearing and bound into the woods, finding a small tree to hold myself up with. The thing's voice kept ringing out. Catch my horse. Catch my horse. It sounded like he was gargling water as he said it over and over. I had a death grip on the tree. I was afraid it would hit the ground again if I let go. I turned to look behind me, and what I saw turned my stomach upside down. The wide-eyed monster had somehow caught my poor horse. How could it have moved so fast, or been that strong? Just in view of the moonlight at the edge of the clearing, on the other side, I could see the back of the thing, as he stood, holding one of Zeb's legs in his hand, down by his side, and slightly offset in front of him, I could see Zeb dragging his body by the front legs in a desperate panic in an attempt to get away. It was useless. With a speed that was incomprehensible, the creature ran its sickle-like claw down Zeb's chin, stopping at the stomach, allowing his insides to spill out. Muscle spasms were all that was left of poor Zeb, as the monster dropped its head to the ground with a sickening slurp, devoured his intestines. Between the pain and what I'd just seen happen to Zeb, I spilled the contents of my stomach on the ground in front of me. I had to move. I had to get away from here. I turned back in the other direction to head deeper into the woods. Fear was pushing me harder and faster than I thought I could move, considering the pain I was experiencing. Eventually, I had to stop for a moment to gather myself. I fell to my knees. My body didn't give me a choice. It felt somehow safer now that I'd put some distance in between me and the clearing that the monster occupied. That's when I noticed. I was just feet away from the two mounds I'd noticed before the horse threw me. My heart instantly filled with dread. I knew then that nothing good was going to occur in those woods that night. As quietly as I could, I inched slowly towards the large, lifeless objects. Before long, I stood looming over one of them. It was J.R. and his horse, minus both of their heads. The horse's neck and all of J.R. looked like they'd been gnawed on by a horse-sized dog. I stumbled backwards in terror, afraid to approach the other mound. But I had to know if it was my dad. I'm ashamed to admit the relief I felt when I looked upon the mangled body of H's horse. 
I spun around and quickly scanned the rest of the area. And there was no sign of my father, nor H. Thank God. I bent over, placing my hands on my knees, drawing deep breaths from the humid Tennessee air as my head spun. A million thoughts were racing through my mind. Where were they? Had they escaped? How far could they make it? How far could I make it? What the hell was that? My moment of solitary was soon shattered, when a loud, drowning version of my father's voice broke the silence from behind. Come back now, Brad. This isn't funny. I pushed through the rest of the night, one step in front of the next, as my father's voice echoed through the hollows. It had long become clear that my back was injured from the fall. Every step I took was a painstaking reminder. The severity of my injuries was a mystery, but the loss of feeling in my left hand wasn't. As the sun rose, there was still no sign of my dad or H, nor the horrendous creature that had attacked us. Heat came from above and plagued my speed. My best guess, it was somewhere around one in the afternoon, and nearing one hundred degrees. My location, on the other hand, I couldn't even have begun to calculate. When I ran from the creature the night before, I had no idea in which direction I'd gone. At the time, I only focused on staying on the tops of the ridges. That way, if I was ambushed, I could try my luck with a plunge off the side of a cliff, instead of having my head removed from my body. That may sound terrible, but you didn't see how easy it was for that monster to remove my horse's back legs. One thing was clear. I needed to make a decision. Should I keep moving and hope to find help? Maybe run into my father with a little luck? Or would I find some place to hole up for the night? If I kept on walking, trying to find help, and didn't, that would likely be my end. I wouldn't stand a chance another night out in the open and on the move. Hell, I wouldn't have made it through the previous night if they hadn't had two horses and J.R. to keep them preoccupied, as sad as that is to say. It was safe to assume that the white eyes of the monster I'd encountered were responsible for the blinking lights I'd followed. That meant there were at least two of those things out here for sure. There was no possible way to tell how many more lurked just out of sight as I limped along. Worst of all, they were smart. They'd lured me away from the group by spooking Dad's horse, I assumed. They were able to break into his truck and call me from his stolen cell phone. Not to mention strong enough to kill a grown man and two horses. That settled it. I would find somewhere to hide. Get some rest, and as soon as day broke, haul ass. With a little luck, I could find one of the creeks or rivers that coursed through these hills. The water would not only wet my whistle, but I knew there had to be a handful of old hunting shacks built on the water that had long been forgotten. I knew a dilapidated wooden lean-to wouldn't do much in the way of actually protecting me, but one just feels safer inside four walls. Plus... Anything was better than spending another night on the move. I didn't think I could manage that. There hadn't been any sign of the creature since right before the sun came up. I was hoping that wasn't a coincidence. Maybe the creature was a nocturnal predator. Or maybe it was just stalking me, waiting for last night's feast to wear off before attacking. It could go either way. Regardless, I couldn't get the thing off my mind. I wouldn't be able to for a long time. It was the most awful thing I had ever seen. It seemed like I would never shake the smell of mothballs. It doesn't start getting dark in Tennessee during the summer until around seven in the afternoon. This left me with a few hours before night started to set in. My first goal was to find a creek or river and then locate a low limb tree climb up as high as my injured body would carry me, and rest. Once rested, I would climb down, 
follow the creek in either direction and hope to God I could find somewhere to hide. Now, there are a few ways you can go about finding bodies of water in the wilderness. If it's around sunrise or sunset, you can look to the skies. Birds usually visit their water source around these times. That method wouldn't help me now, though. Another trick is to find well-traveled animal paths. Animals in the wild don't usually roam at will. Find a trail they frequented enough to leave tracks behind, and it's likely it'll lead you to water at some point. Aside from those two methods, you can read the landscape if you know what to look for. This was how I planned to do it. I looked for rock structures that pointed to open mouth caves, which are responsible for a lot of the creeks around here. Finding water at the source is ideal, because you don't have to worry about a dead animal or anything else contaminating it upstream. After a couple of hours, I found what I was looking for. A fast-moving stream that started at the mouth of a small cluster of boulders. I fell to my knees on one of the rocks that made up the stream's bank and dipped my entire head in the water. It was cold, and nothing had ever felt any better. I could feel the previous night washing off of me. I drank my fill of water. Then I flipped over flat stones until I had a few crawdads by the tails. I split them in half and sucked their innards out. It wasn't ideal, but a fire was out of the question. I didn't have the time. Once I'd taken care of myself, I decided to climb to the top of one of the larger boulders and rest there. Once I painstakingly reached the top of the enormous boulder, I took my boots off, spread eagle, and soaked in the sun. The cold water that clung to my hair, mixed with a warm sun, was all I could take. I was violently yanked from a deep sleep by a skin-crawling scream that seemed to be coming from a few hollows over. It was almost dark now. Oh, what had I done? I'd only intended to rest for a few hours, tops. I had to have been out for at least four. I knew I couldn't waste any time as I laced my boots up. The screaming continued. I couldn't tell how far away it was. It sounded like a woman, but it sounded like the source was gurgling water as they screamed. There was no telling how many voices these creatures had taken. With my boots laced, I slid down the side of the boulder and landed on my feet with a soft thud. I crossed the creek a few times, hoping it would be like in the movies and the creature would lose my scent because of this. <laughs> Fat chance. I barreled through the woods, pushed by the adrenaline to stay alive once again, and trying not to think about anything else. I traveled half a mile downstream before seeing my wood fortress to be. This was it. I wasn't going to find a better option. Not without risking my life by letting the white-eyed devil gain ground on me. I quickly pulled my hatchet from its sheath, which had been hanging from my belt. I searched around and found a large maple tree that's branches had reached down to the ground. I chopped a few limbs down that were perfect sizes to make spears and headed into the abandoned shack. I stepped inside, absorbing my surroundings. There wasn't much inside besides some old snack cake wrappers, bottles of vodka, empty unfortunately, and an old stained mattress that sat atop some milk crates. This would do just fine. I immediately went to work using the edge of my hatchet, which was sharp thanks to my obsession with knives and such. Soon, I had three spears that were about six feet long. The plan was, if I was attacked, I would use the spear to keep separation between myself and the thing that was coming for me. I decided to run back out and find a log that was long enough that I could push it against the inside of the door and wedge it against the adjacent wall. It would be just another line of defense in what would be my final stand. A couple of hours had passed and it was almost completely dark outside. I sat inside the windowless shack, playing out scenarios in my mind over and over. The likelihood I could survive another encounter with one of those things seemed low. If both showed up, it was over. 
The screams were now a mixture of my dad's voice and an unidentified female. I'd always heard these creatures would use your own voice as a scare tactic. Luckily, this one hadn't. I wondered how long these things had been out here, hunting and killing. I'd used the trail road here a few dozen times, and never encountered anything out of the ordinary. Sure, there were tales that got passed around, since the cemetery was the last thing you saw before entering the woods. But this was no ghost. It was as real as you or me. I closed my eyes and trained my ears the best I could to the noises from just outside the lean-to's walls. The screaming had abruptly stopped, but now it sounded like the wind was blowing the tops of the trees down. I could hear them sway as they cracked and popped. How could I have forgotten that the thing had jumped out of a tree the night before? Crouching in the center of the shack, sitting on the log that was holding the door shut, I held my breath and listened closely. Sweat poured from my forehead, and my hands wouldn't stop shaking. The trees had stopped moving. There was no wind. It was deadly silent. All of a sudden, something knocked on the door. Although I wanted to scream, I didn't dare move. The door wouldn't keep that thing out for long, but maybe long enough for me to attack it. Brad, is that you in there? We aren't far from one of the main roads. The way the crow flies, at least. Come on out and we'll head that way. Come on, we need to hurry. A voice I recognized whispered from just the other side of the rotten wood door. My father's voice was betraying the creature. Although he had gotten better at mimicking him, it was still apparent that something was off. He paused for a moment before repeating himself verbatim, and then stopped again. This creature didn't have many of my father's words mastered. Still, he tried again anyway. This time he was becoming angry. He pushed against the door. It barely budged. Come on now, son. Open up. We don't have time for this. I swear it's me. We need to get back. His voice shook. I began to wonder if, maybe, it was actually my father when I heard branches from above crack and my father's voice scream in terror from the shack's front porch. The thing was trying hard to scare me, and boy was it succeeding. I grabbed my longest spear and squatted in the middle of the shack, holding the point towards the door, trying to prepare myself for whatever came next. The trees above me sounded like a tornado was blowing through them. Something heavy slammed into the roof of my hideout, and my father's voice cried out, Run, Brad, run! I wasn't falling for it. It was trying to draw me out again. <laughs> Not this time, I thought. I held my position, both hands holding the spear straight up with the base supported by the ground and the hatchet back on my belt. It was going to attack from above again. Not without a fight from me, though. The creature slammed into the roof again, and this time the old rafters couldn't take the weight. The slam was followed by the sound of ancient wood snapping and breaking, and a thousand wood splinters exploded like a grenade into the room, causing me to turn my head to protect my eyes. Just as I did, something heavy came down on top of me, knocking me on my back followed by an explosion of something wet. <sighs> the bastard must have come down right on my spear. My plan worked. I rolled over and looked up to see my father, just as he yanked the spear from his chest and blood covered the floor. Sweet Jesus. It really had been my father at the door. My paranoia had stopped me from looking to see who it was. And now, because of me, my father was bleeding out in the floor. 
I rushed to his side, thrusting my hands over the wound in a feeble attempt to stop the blood loss. He looked up, past me, through the hole in the roof, into the trees, and I did the same. There was a pair of glowing white eyes looking down at me, and I could hear a faint growling. I turned back to my dad and frantically said, Dad, I'm so sorry. I thought it was that, that whatever that was. I didn't know it was you. You have to get up and run. I'll hold this thing off as long as I can. He kept his eyes locked on the creature in the trees. It's okay, son. That thing had been following you, and I was following it. It disappeared, so I thought it was safe to come out. But it snatched me from the porch, and well, you know the rest. He chuckled as he said this. Only he wouldn't lose his sense of humor at a time like this. I looked up through the hole in the roof, and the creature was gone. Tears poured from my eyes as I saw the blood staining my hands that covered the hole in his chest. I'm going to go out there and try and lure it away. When it comes for me, you run to the road, I replied. Dad smiled, and before speaking, coughed up a mouthful of blood. No, you aren't. J.R. and I killed the other one, but it took J.R. with him. I plan to return the favor. Here, help me up. I pulled him to his feet. Blood seeped through the one hand over the hole in his chest, and he used the other to take a spear and prop himself up. He turned to me and said, We're both going out the front door. I'll go left. You try to make it to my horse. Go right. The road back to town is just over the next hollow. You can make it. You don't have a choice. I knew there was no sense in arguing with him. This wasn't a debate. He had just told me what was going to happen, and it would one way or another. We hugged, and both of us grunted in pain as we did. The last thing he said to me before we ran through the door with a smile was, We're getting out of the horse business today after this, okay boy? I jumped off the porch and ran as hard as I could, a spear in one hand and my hatchet in the other. I tried to listen for any signs of my father or the creature, but didn't hear any. I flew through the woods, my own speed surprising me. The moon was brighter than the night before, and up ahead I could see where the woods stopped. Hopefully, it was the road. Finally, I burst from the woods out onto the black top, and paused, looking left and right, trying to decide which route was best. I decided to go left, and jogged along the shoulder, hoping at any moment my dad would emerge from the woods, though I knew this was unlikely. I ran steadily down the shoulder, for what felt like forever, and still there was nothing but woods as far as I could see. It felt like I would never make it. Something caught me off guard. I felt a fiery pain shoot through my left leg, and I hit the ground. I rolled over and looked at my thigh, only to see one of my spears sticking out from it. I spun my head around, and just behind me in the road, the white-eyed creature was bounding towards me in long, smooth, unnatural strides. I got to my knees and yanked the spear from my leg, felt like I would faint from the pain, but what adrenaline I had left pushed me harder than ever. I climbed to my feet and, in a last chance power drive, sprinted towards the creature. The creature's mouth slowly opened, impossibly wide, as I closed in on him. It had teeth like a shark, except they were longer, curled and twisted. The teeth looked like roots. It had scaly skin that looked like tree bark. Its arms were so long its fingers dragged along the ground as it walked. This was the first time I'd truly seen the monster. My eyes burned, it was so ugly. It rang out my father's voice for the last time. 
This isn't funny. Come back now. This isn't funny, Brad, it said, almost mockingly. I couldn't have agreed more. Still running, I lowered the spear in my left hand, holding it tight against my waist for support, and drew the hatchet back behind my ear as I closed in on the freak of nature. We collided in the middle of the road. My spear only grazed his side, but my hatchet landed true in the creature's sternum with a sickening thud and it recoiled, falling to its back and scrambling away with the hatchet still lodged in its chest. I got to my feet and grabbed the spear with both hands and ran and jumped on top of it, planting the spear through its throat. The creature let out a series of screams that sounded like a hundred voices rolled into one. It was horrifying. I pushed my foot on the creature's chest, removing the hatchet. I knelt beside the wriggling Goliath, holding it down with a spear, and commenced to hack. I didn't stop until there was nothing left but a bloody pulp. I was dizzy from blood loss and exerting so much effort. Still, I made it to my feet using the spear as a crutch. I removed my belt and fashioned a half-ass tourniquet. I then started limping back in the direction I'd been traveling when I was attacked. I don't know exactly how far I made it before collapsing. I don't know how long I laid in the road before I got lucky and someone drove through and saw me. I woke up in the hospital some days later. They said I was dehydrated and had experienced severe trauma to my right leg. Oof, they had no idea what trauma was. The police had been waiting outside my room when I woke up. Boy, did they have some questions. Where were J.R. and H.? Where was my father? I knew the answer to two of those for sure, and had a good idea about the other one. I lied to the police lot, naturally. I told them we were ambushed by some angry hunters and gave them fake descriptions. They would never have believed me. I wasn't going to be ridden off as crazy, not after everything I'd been through. My family was allowed in after the police finished their questioning, and they were ecstatic to see me, and were worried about my father. I lied to them too, and told them he'd died before we made it out. Well, it was mostly a lie, but the likely probability was that he had died. There was no reason for them to have to know the truth. The Gilly Hill Church of Christ minister even visited me. I actually told him the truth. He didn't respond, just said God bless and left. I spent a week in total in the hospital, and to this day I carry a limp. The bodies of my father and the others were never recovered. All we found of the horses were their hooves and the saddles. I'd like to say it all ended there, but it didn't. I have another horse now. Sorry, Dad. I didn't get out of the business like you wanted. It's just that... Well, the horse makes it easier to hunt those white-eyed sons of bitches. What did you think of that one? I loved it. I thought that was a brilliant story. Very, very kind of the author to share it with me over on Dr. Creepman's Vault, the subreddit I set up for you to share your work with me, and hopefully for me to get around to reading it at some point. Ooh, long one this evening, but I will be back with the second part of Satan's Theatre on Friday, so please join me again real soon. That's enough for me for tonight, though. You have a nice rest of the week. See you again on Friday, but until then... Bye-bye.